How did you convert to Islam? We heard that you became Muslim twice. Can you explain this? How did your family and friends react when you embraced Islam? Have you ever tried to give dawah to your family? You had a debate with one of the world's most famous atheists. Did you feel excited, angry, or fearing that I can't explain Islam well? I don't know. Ah, it's a very difficult question. I actually used to pray before I became Muslim. There have been moments where I was very close to leaving the dawah or giving up. What is the biggest dream that you wanted to come true? <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ, he said in a hadith, We want to start with, who is Hamza Tortis? That's a very good question. There is a tradition, it's not necessarily a hadith. Brother, we have a big problem. Oh, sorry. The problem is that you have so much knowledge. I have to make it simple. Yeah? Like, so, I know it's hard, but yeah. you got to short your knowledge. Yeah, you I have just to... ask who is Hamza Tortis. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. Yeah, but I was, going, I was going to basically say, I don't know. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> okay. Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters. While making this video, a lot of things went wrong. This video was edited from the beginning about three to four times. But alhamdulillah, we have finally managed to complete it. We continue to work with all our might to convey these truths of Islam to the whole world. Just by clicking the subscribe button, you would be given a huge support to this effort. Let's be a part of this family and let's together walk towards eternity. Who is Hamza Tortis? That's a very good question. So. I was born in England, in London, in 1980. I converted to Islam in 2002. My parents come from a Greek background. My mother is from Kybris, Cyprus, mm. and my dad is from Greece, Atina. And I'm 41 years old, alhamdulillah. And I am a student of Islam, and I want to educate people about Islam, and I hope to do that with hikmah, with wisdom, and with rahmah, with mercy. Alhamdulillah. Before Islam, were you a Christian like your family or were you in the process of searching? That's another good question. I wouldn't say I was brought up as a Christian per se, although we believed in God. My dad moved away from dogmatic religion. Basically, he believed in Jesus, he believed in spirituality, he believed in humanistic type of values, but also he wasn't secular. From that perspective, he was very spiritual. So my father had his existential journey. He has his own idea on what it means to connect to God because he was anti-church. Not anti-church that he hated the church, but he was like, the church is in your heart. Right? You don't need the church to connect to God. And he had that type of perspective. But sometimes we go to Greek church on, uh, during Easter because in the Greek Orthodox tradition, Easter is more significant than Christmas. So I wouldn't even consider ourselves as Christian, maybe more like secular, spiritual, humanist types, if that makes sense. How did you convert to Islam? We heard that you became Muslim twice. Can you explain this? Well, that's not entirely true. It wasn't the second time I became Muslim, because in the video, there's a video that's online, it's almost the second time I became Muslim, because there was a period when I became Muslim where I, ha I was affected with a destructive doubt. But along my journey, I realized that the Islamic intellectual tradition had the answers. So in the beginning of my journey, I was attracted to the values of Islam. I was convinced with the Islamic intellectual tradition, the intellectual foundations of Islam, and I also had an attraction to the values of Islam. And the other thing that helped me become a Muslim was I actually used to pray before I became Muslim. And I remember my friend telling me, he wasn't really my friend at the time, he was a little bit, but we weren't that close, but he was my brother's friend. And I remember him saying when I was at college to my Muslim friends, if I remember correctly, he basically said, when you're in sajda, prostration, you are closest to Allah, you're closest to your Lord, so supplicate, talk to Allah. So I learned how to pray. And I would pray and I would talk to Allah in sajda and ask him for guidance. How did your family and friends react when you embraced Islam? Have you ever tried to give dawah to your family? It was difficult to some degree because they felt that they probably had a negative understanding of Islam based on maybe historical reasons, social reasons, things that they read. But now the perception is totally different. We have a very kind of authentic, open relationship where I talk about 
various things concerning Islam and you know they sit and listen and especially my dad is like oh really that's that's you know he shows a lot of interest and I think the best way to give doubt to your parents is to be dedicated is to be dedicated to the service you know to be yeah so it reminds me of what Professor Suleiman Darin, he's from Mamar University, his parents were ill. So I was WhatsApping him, I was trying to give him some kind of type of encouragement. Um, and he said something very moving. He basically said, I'm trying to deserve their prayers for me. So, uh, yeah, you, you have to be at the service to your parents as best as possible. Uh, what is the biggest dream that you wanted to come true? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in a hadith, love for the people what you love for yourself, love for linnas. This is different from the hadith concerning brotherhood. The other hadith is, is which is also authentic hadith, la yu'minu ahadakum hatta yuhibba li akhihi ma yuhibba li nafsihi. You won't truly believe unless you love for your brother what you love for yourself. This also means humanity as well. So imagine we show to people, whoever they are, that we're committed to their happiness, we're committed to their goodness, we're committed to their well-being. And obviously the dream is of people closer to you to be happy, including your parents. In this life and in the Akhirah, if only they knew who Allah really was, and if only they connected to Allah the way Allah wants them to connect to Him. If that happened, a lot of these things would totally disappear, you know? I remember one moment when I was driving my parents uh, to my house for dinner and then I took them back. We were talking about different things and my parents were like, you know, almost bickering, but in a nice way. And I was just naturally saying things about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I say, Mom, chill out. You know, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would say this and whatever the case may be. And my dad was listening because it came naturally. It was, it was a natural response uh, to what was going on. And on the way back, he said, you know, the stuff that you told me today, Andrea, you know, I believe this Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, is a prophet. You know, he said those words, right? Because, you know, the ethics and the narrative that I was, that was expressing was natural, right? And I, I do that a lot now, hopefully these days. You know, you plant the seeds. You plant the seeds and it's Allah's job to decide what He wants to do with that seed. Was there a moment when you said, I can't do this anymore, I'm quitting the dawah? There have been moments where I was very close to leaving the dawah or giving up, if you like. Now, every time, from what I remember, when I tried to do that, Allah gave me something to ensure that I stayed on this path or helped me. There's, there's a few moments, but let me give you one experience. So, from what I remember, I was in Pakistan and I was giving lectures at the private universities and I came back and I think it was at Fajr time. When I was praying, after I prayed Fajr, I made dua to Allah. And it was a very specific dua because in that evening, I was going to have a debate with Professor Graham Thompson at Queen Mary University of London. And it was on the topic of Islam or atheism, I believe. And if I remember correctly, I was very disheartened with the dawah, meaning I didn't want Want to, I needed a sign. I actually asked Allah for a sign. From what, from what I remember, this is many years ago, but if I remember correctly, it was like, oh Allah, show me a sign for me to stay on this path that someone today at the debate becomes Muslim. I was very specific. So fast forward a few hours, I had a debate with Professor Graham Thompson. It was a successful debate, alhamdulillah. And as I was walking away, going home, I think my son was with me at the time. Brothers stopped me and they wanted to have a conversation with me and they introduced me to this half Greek, half Serbian brother called George. From what I remember, his name was George. And he basically was not Muslim and he was interested in Islam and he already received some materials and he was reading about Islam, but he had a question about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he wanted to know more. So I gave him the argument that which was about if you reject the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's the equivalent of rejecting your own mother. If you want to know more about this argument, you could uh, download my book for free. It's called The Divine Reality. It's available on the Sapiens Institute website. And there is a Turkish version of that book as well. It's chapter 14. And I said, if you, if you understand this, I'm not telling you to become a Muslim, but at least be consistent. Here's my phone. I think I had a Blackberry phone at that time. I just almost threw it at him. I said, here's my phone. Call your mother and say that you have to doubt her because now you're not accepting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the general gist of that idea. So he basically becomes Muslim. 
because he understood that if I reject the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam based on what Hamza has told me and the conversation that we had, it was around an hour or more conversation. I think it was about an hour and a half or something, or at least about an hour. And he realized if if I reject this man sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it's equivalent of rejecting my own mother. But I know my mother gave birth to me. But there's far more evidence concerning that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the final prophet and he was speaking the truth. And he became a Muslim. And he's such a nice guy. He's an amazing akhlaq very humble person so you done this sign and then well then he helps you doesn't it and then you continue you had a debate with one of the world's most famous atheists how was the moment for you did you feel excited angry or fearing that i can't explain islam well there's always a worry that you're not going to do good or you're not going to do great or you're going to say some things that you shouldn't have said and that's just part of life and we make mistakes like it happens to us all the time and when i prepared for that debate it was a significant moment because it was i think one of the first times that in contemporary era that a muslim had an engagement intellectual engagement with the atheists because the new atheist movement was relatively new it's a, it's a post 9/11 phenomenon if you like and at that time you know new atheism was on the rise now it's almost dead right it's dying in the west but it's going to other countries now yeah the the new atheism atheism itself is different from new atheism yeah there's a there's, there are distinctions to be made but professor kraus was you know i think he was being seen as a replacement for christopher hitchens because at that time he was quite unwell um and anyway was that a successful debate for you yeah of course i mean it's nearly got 5 million views it still gets lots of views from a views perspective it's successful but that doesn't mean anything because views doesn't always mean impact my point is it was successful from the point of view that even though i made mistakes right after that i did a masters in philosophy i did a masters in research in philosophy and now i'm doing my phd so obviously i've developed hopefully quite a lot since then and i do want to one day analyze that debate and maybe fix some of the errors and maybe unpack some of the ideas that i wanted to portray because it wasn't perfect but nevertheless the very fact that a muslim was there with a famous academic who is an atheist probably a new atheist the very fact i was there and challenging him we already won that's why his strategy i believe was just to belittle me and people became muslim because of that debate and people are still watching it now our debates the best way forward for the dawa debates should be used again in context based on the maslaha masada does it increase the benefits does it decrease the harms my debate with professor kraus it was at the right time i think because new atheism was taking hold of the muslim community and this actually was you know someone trying to defend islam and show the veracity of islam and it worked to a certain degree right alhamdulillah have you ever been attacked while giving dawa No. You mean physically attacked? Yes. No, because if that did happen, they would have a janaza. Ah, oh. uh, no, I'm only kidding. No, but there was confrontational moments. I remember many years ago I had a conversation with someone from the extreme right wing and he was trying to belittle Islam and so on and so forth. He came very close to me. I tried to get the best out of him, and at the end he hugged me. And I think this is something that we should adopt in the dawa. It's creating the best version of that person through the conversation. And this is similar I believe to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the way he spoke to people. He would get the best version out of people through how he interacted with them. From what I remember, Khalid bin Walid was butchering the Muslims before he became a Muslim. How did he become a Muslim? I think wrote a letter, got someone to write a letter to Khalid bin Walid and say, "How can a wise person, such a wise person, how can he not become a Muslim?" So do you see, he's elevating the person, he's getting the best out of the person through his expression to get the best out of that person and they will give you the best results. And this is a very hard thing to do. You have to be very conscious of it, but it really works. So for example, sometimes in a dawa context, someone says, "Are you allowed to hit your women?" "Yes or no?" "Yes or no?" Or "Do you believe you should cut the hand?" "Yes or no?" "Yes or no?" And they say, "I don't want yes or no, just yes or no." And I'll be like, "Listen, my friend. I know you're a sincere person. And I know if I asked you a question about what is your views on abortion, yes or no, yes or no is not going to represent you. So it's not going to represent me." And I know you're sincere and I know you here to hear me out and to really engage with me and I'm really happy you didn't go on Google but you came to me and since you're such a sincere guy I'm telling you just give me 2 minutes I'm going to explain this to you and then they become calm say okay then no problem because what you've done you've affirmed that they're sincere you've affirmed that they're such a nice person even though they may have come to you with aggression even though they may have come to you with harshness but this is what I spoke about earlier surah fusilat 
chapter 41, verse 34, good and evil are not the same, repel by that which is better. And if there's any hatred between two people, it will turn to intimate friendship. So speak to people in confrontational situations in a way that gets the best out of them, even though they don't deserve it, even though they're not expressing the best version of themselves. But the minute you do it, you create that personality in the dynamic of the conversation. And if it doesn't work, then obviously you have every right to protect yourself. <laughs> But you should try your best because remember what I said earlier before, it always links, about, it links to principles. Ask the question, what does Allah want from me from this situation? A specific characteristic, for example, Hamza, when you're giving dawah, you're so angry. No, actually... A, a common I, criticism. I, I, well, maybe in the past, but in the past maybe eight years or five years, I get criticized for being too nice or too soft. Yeah. They say, where's the lion? We want the lion back, yeah? <laughs> now... I'm going to be very honest with you. I feel that if you're always one trait, if you're always aggressive and angry, with all due respect, that is a huge sign of weakness. You could have prayed, read the Quran by yourself and move on with your life, with your own life. Why did you choose a path like this? I mean, giving dawah. I think it was in line with my personality. When I loved something, I would talk about it. So it's a natural thing. If you love something, you're going to share it. So naturally, if you love Islam, you would want to share it as well. Look, at the end of the day, I have tasted a very sweet mango. I've tasted this mango. If I'm a good human being, I want other people to taste this mango, right? I want to share this goodness that I have. And I've had this experience of sweetness, which is Islam. And if the whole world says to me, no, it's not sweet, I'm not going to believe them because they haven't tasted my mango, right? So you have that sense of confidence because I've tasted it. I want you to taste what I'm tasting. So that's another motivation that you want good for people. Like if, you, if, you, if you're a decent human being, you know, you want to be committed to the goodness and guidance of all people. You want people to be happy. And if this is what makes people happy, then you need to give it to people. What's wrong with you? Why are you so selfish? And just, just to end on this point, the reward is so huge. Think about this. Imagine one person becomes a Muslim because of your work through the will of Allah. One person. That person becomes married. So there's two people now. And they have two children. So there's four people now. And then they get married. And they have two children each. Within one or two generations, you're getting the reward for ten people. Their salah. The qiyam, the sadaqah, the zakah, the recitation of the Qur'an, the hajj, the umrah, the good deeds, the sadaqah, and so on and so forth. You get all of that reward just because by giving da'wah to one person, you open the one or two generations of Muslims. It's very important for us to, you know, if you think about the reward aspect, there's nothing more rewardable. It's also, for me, meaningful. Because, you know, what, what are you going to do? You're going to read Quran, pray, and you're going to be at home, and then you get married, you have kids, you have a job, you get a house, you get a car, then you die. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do. You could have a very pious life. Do you have an added meaning to your existence? Because Allah says in the Quran, O oh, you who believe, respond to the call of Allah and His Messenger to that which gives you life. This ayah is talking to people who are already alive. So as if Allah is giving you life on top of your life. And for me, there is a sense of added meaning that you're talking about the truth of Islam. So that would be my answer concerning why I do things like this. If you had the opportunity to watch a moment from the time of our Prophet's life, what moment would it be? Ah, it's a very difficult question. I don't know. There's just so many moments, but... Very difficult to... Okay, if you look at the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his daily routine, I think maybe if I wanted to experience his presence, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it would probably be at Fajr time. Spending time in the masjid, praying Fajr Jama'at, then doing your zikr and athkar and asking him questions because that was the moment, right? The Sahaba would ask him questions and you have an indication where the Sahaba would also be very comfortable and relaxed and they would talk about their jahiliya and laugh about it. Do you have a specific question that you want to personally ask the Prophet ﷺ? A specific question. No, I, I, am, I would ask him to make dua for me. The du'as of the, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are accepted, right? So just make du'a for me. Make du'a that, you know, I'm successful in this life and hereafter and so is my family. What else can you ask for? I mean, think about it. Is there anything else you can ask for? Yeah. And it's known that the Prophet Sallallahu would not say no to requests. 
what else would you want? I mean, what I'm going to ask about, you know, the, the issues concerning the ikhtilaf in aqidah or a question about this, this is, becomes all irrelevant. Yeah, this is, the, yeah, I mean, this is all in the grand cosmic scheme of things. You're with the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the beloved of Allah. Yeah, I'm going to ask his beloved, Habibullah, can, please make dua for me and my family. What else, what else is there? Khalas, there's nothing else, right? Yeah. You have one minute and the whole world is listening to you right now. Christians, Jews, atheists. What would you like to say to them? Please turn to camera. You have just one minute. All atheists, Jews, Christians, Muslims, all the people around you. Even the people at the Amazons are listening to you. When you say, I'm ready, I'll just start. I, are you getting sweaty? No, I'm trying to oh. think of an answer. It's very difficult for someone like me to put that in one minute. You, you can't skip this question. You've got to give the answer, brother. Okay. Uh, you, can, you can wait. Maybe I can say, you know... I'll put it like this, three, two, one, go. Brothers and sisters and friends and humanity, if you want contentment in this life and eternal bliss in the life to come, then say and internalize the following. La ilaha illallah Muhammadan Rasulullah. There is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, is his final messenger. We know Allah is worthy of worship by virtue of who he is. When you study his word, study the Quran, you realize the maximally perfect nature of his names and attributes and Allah is worthy of extensive praise and ultimate gratitude because of his names and attributes and praise and gratitude are a form of worship. When you study the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will come to the conclusion that he wasn't lying or deluded. It's not based on a legend, but rather he was speaking the truth. And if he's speaking the truth, then he is the final messenger should be followed with regards to our way of life. Study these two things and inshallah, eternal bliss. Abi, right now you look like you need a coffee, Abi Jim. I can see it in your eyes. Like lights are on. Light is on. No one's at home. <laughs> Honestly, if you ask me questions, I could be here all day. Yeah, who's gonna attack me, Abi? If they attack me, they must be crazy. No, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. Stop for stop for I do one more time. One more time. And you could choose which one best. Okay. Last one. Three. So the fourth one. Take four. Last one. Five. Five. We gotta get this right. Because that was longer than a minute and that was the best one, I think, but we need it shorter. Ayy Allah! <laughs> I feel okay. sorry for the post-production team. <laughs> you are the hardest job ever. Allah Akbar.